to you all to St Albans Cathedral on this third Sunday of Easter. It's a joy, uh, a special welcome uh, to those who are here at the Abbey for the first time. Please know a warm welcome and it's our joy to have the choir from the parish of Canterbury St Stephen's singing our services this weekend during our Cathedral Choir's well-earned Easter holidays. Uh, as having, before coming here to the Cathedral, being Archdeacon of Canterbury, uh, the community of St Stephen's is one uh, well known to me and I can assure you that the gift of their music amongst us this morning will be a joy as we gather. In your yellow notice sheets, along with the white service uh, uh, sheet, you'll find details of um, what's coming up in the week ahead. Uh, and also you'll see um, the hymns, psalms and readings for this morning's service. And I encourage you to take that yellow notice sheet home with you so that you can take home the Coronation Weekend celebration details. And uh, do come and join us for those. We will be live screening the coronation in the nave. So if you're local and want to bring your picnic and gather round, um, please do and bring your friends and neighbours along as well. Take it home as well because there's so much else coming up at the Abbey that you are very, very welcome to join in, including our learning department, our small groups and other social activities, as well as our worship life together. Uh, welcome, welcome and uh, three times welcome to you all and for this morning's worship, uh, details of this morning's service begin at the bottom of page seven, page seven of the yellow notice sheet.
Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. As we gather in this Easter tide, in the Gospel we encounter Jesus' disciples meeting their risen Lord, and in the breaking of bread, coming to know him more deeply. So as we gather in word and sacrament, may that same gift be ours. Together we pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. away all malice and evil, and confessing our sins with a sincere and true heart. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against thee and against our neighbour, in thought, word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliverance of we are heartily sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve thee in innocent life, to the glory of thy name. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
let us pray. Almighty Father, who in thy great mercy gladden the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve thee continually in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the people, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus Christ according to Luke. (laughs) 
On that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? Jesus asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. But he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he was going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised Jesus, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It has to be my favourite story in the whole Bible, and I know it is for many other people as well. In our Gospel reading today, The Road to Emmaus, we have it all. There is hidden identity and revelation, irony and humour, encounter and transformation. It really is a great story, and I think it has such a lot to say to us this morning. There are two disciples, one of whom we know to be Cleopas, the other we don't know the identity of. But whoever they are, they're getting out of town. It is still what we know as Easter Day, but late in the afternoon or early evening. They have seen their Lord and Master arrested, crucified and buried. I guess their stomachs must have been churning. Everything they had dreamt of, everything they had experienced in the past three years, seemingly lost in the events of the last three days. Things hadn't turned out as expected, and there may well have been a real fear that having seen their leader arrested and then put to death, 
that they would be next. Anyone associated with this dangerous subversive would be next. And so they pack up and flee Jerusalem. We know that this fear was genuine. In other resurrection appearances, we get a sense of this. In the story of Doubting Thomas, last week's gospel, we're told that the other disciples had locked themselves into the room where they were, where they were meeting, two weeks running, locked in for fear of the authorities, locked in by fear. In another resurrection story, Simon Peter announces that he is going fishing, and some get in the boat and go with him. It's as if they are going back to their old ways, as if they had never been called to leave their nets and follow Jesus. So quickly do they lapse back to the familiar and safe, as if nothing had ever happened. And so here are two of the wider group heading away from Jerusalem. And as they walk, they talk. And as they journey, a third figure comes up alongside them, an unrecognized traveler with them on the road. It is, of course, the risen Jesus, but they fail to grasp this. Why don't they recognize him? Well, we're not really sure. Perhaps it was because as they walked along, they weren't facing each other, and so they didn't get a proper look. They were talking and walking three abreast, and so not looking straight at this other person. Or perhaps the appearance of Jesus was transformed in some way, because in some of the other resurrection stories, Others don't realize who it is straight away either. <coughs> or perhaps it was the last person they were expecting to see, and so they just don't realize who it is. Well, we don't know why it is that they don't recognize Jesus, but they don't. I wonder, though, if it was because they were so busy talking and thinking about themselves they fail to encounter the presence of Jesus in their midst. And I think it's a helpful reminder to us about stillness and quiet. We might bear that in mind when we come to a service. Before it, we need to be quiet and still, to spend time in prayer so that we are in the right frame of mind to worship God so that we are ready for an encounter with the risen Lord in our presence. Or if we don't, like the travellers on the road, we might just never recognise him in our time together. So the two travellers are talking so much that they fail to recognise the presence of Jesus. And then there is this beautiful irony it's almost like Shakespeare, this exchange between the disciples and Jesus. Are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's been going on? And they are, of course, saying this to the very person who has died and risen for them. And yet Jesus' response is not to rebuke them. He wants to see where they are, where they are and what they've understood. And so he asks, what things? And then listens. The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. They're telling this man with them about the very things that he himself has undergone and yet he doesn't rebuke them, or not straight away, but he allows them to talk. And then he responds by opening the scriptures to them in this group as they travel together. 
It's a wonderful picture to hold in our minds as we resume our home groups after Easter. These two are a chance, like for those disciples, to travel together and to share, to open ourselves up, to support one another on our Christian faith, to ask questions, to allow God to speak to us in new and exciting ways. I hope that perhaps you will think seriously about joining a group. It's a great way of getting some freshness and new insights into our relationship with God. When did we last read a Christian book? When did we last spend more than a snatched moment in prayer? When did we last have a conversation with someone in church that was more than for a few moments? I have a real hope and dream that these groups will be the key building blocks in the life of our cathedral. There are no experts, just fellow travellers. We come together to walk alongside each other and to encounter the God who comes alongside us also in the risen Lord. And as the group arrives in Emmaus, they've got to the destination. And it's interesting that Jesus goes as if to carry on, to leave them. And they beckon to him. They ask him to stay and share a meal with them. It's as if it was only when they actually invited Jesus, please stay with us, they invited him, that then they realised who it was. Not the other way round, not, oh my goodness, it's Jesus, please stay with us. But actually, whoever you are, stay with us. Oh, it's you, Jesus. That way round. They hadn't chosen Jesus to come alongside them and explain the scriptures. He had appeared in their little group. But now they must return the invitation and invite Jesus to stay or he will slip from their eyes and they'll never realise who it was or have the full encounter on offer. And I think that's a powerful metaphor for faith. God is present and willing, but at some point we've got to be open to invite Jesus into our lives and keep inviting him because it is then and only then that our lives will be transformed too. And of course, then there is this beautiful moment when Jesus takes the bread, blesses, breaks, and shares. And suddenly, these two disciples recognize who it is. They've seen this action before, just a few days before, in the upper room. Jesus has taken bread, blessed, broken, and shared it. And it speaks to us of a new encounter, a moment of revelation, every time we come together to share in the Eucharist. Jesus is revealed to us as we take, bless, break, and share. Every time. And then the final part of the story, but an important one nonetheless. The disciples get up after the meal and head straight back to Jerusalem. Their encounter with Jesus in scripture and in table fellowship has totally transformed these two frightened people. They get up and go. They are now heading in the opposite direction. They go and share what has happened to them with joy and excitement. And so this story speaks into our lives today as we travel the road of faith, as we hear the scriptures and break bread together. Our lives too are turned around and we are ready to go from here and live out and tell out the good news. Alleluia, Christ is risen. 
He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty and eternal God, we humbly beseech thee to inspire continually the universal church with a spirit of truth, unity and concord, that all who confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, hear us. Give grace, O heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests and deacons, especially to thy servant Alan, our bishop, that they may both, by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. Lord, hear us. Lord, to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, 
and especially to this congregation here present, that they may serve thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, hear us. We beseech thee, O Lord, to direct with thy heavenly wisdom those who rule over the nations of the world. Bless thy servant, Charles our King, and all who exercise authority under him, that thy people may be faithfully and justly governed. Lord, hear us. Of thy goodness, O Lord, help and comfort all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We name before you those who have sought the prayers of this cathedral and abbey church, those whose needs are known to each of us, and those whose needs are known to you alone, praying that you would grant them a happy issue out of all their afflictions. Lord, hear us. Lord, we commend to thy gracious keeping, O Lord, all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear. Remembering especially Walter Bebbington, Shirley Bird, Dorothy Chadwick, Sarah Crimp, Gladys Fotheringham, Anna Matthews, Margaret Samuel, Paul Smith, John Terry, beseeching thee to grant them everlasting light and peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, we bless thy holy name for the grace and virtue declared in the blessed Virgin Mary, Auburn, and in all thy saints. Grant that we, rejoicing in their fellowship and following their good examples, may be partakers with them of thy heavenly kingdom. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of thy Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue, perpetual memory of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and grant that by the power of thy Holy Spirit, we receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks to thee, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks to thee, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me.
Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, we thy humble servants, having in remembrance the precious death and passion of thy dear Son, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, entirely desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And although we be unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offences, and to grant that all we who are partakers of this holy communion may be fulfilled with thy grace and heavenly benediction. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. By whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Saviour has taught us. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are one, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia.
Let us pray. O living God, whose Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of the bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in all his redeeming work, who liveth and reigneth now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And my eyes. God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, strengthen you to walk with him in his risen life. The blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.